dearly beloved, I am happy to be here once again. Feels like I'm at home. I'm thankful for the invitation, for the opportunity. I can speak for Brother Rodriguez, having known him, I think, for 18 years. He may have been 87 when we first met. And then I preached in a meeting there in when, 88, 89, somewhere around there. He is a great man. And that work deserves our support. And they need to be doing what they're doing. We don't need to bring men over here to train them except in special situations. They need to be training them over there. And they will be trained correctly because I know the brethren who are doing that, and so I appreciate that. And I encourage you to help in every way you can. I've never done this before in my life, but I'm going to do it tonight. I was in a meeting two weeks ago. I was in a meeting last week. I'm here this week. I need an appointment for next week. <laughs> Let me tell you why. You, you married preachers will understand this. You people here remember me, Mom? My mother-in-law? She came to stay with us three weeks ago. <laughs> She's going to be with us one more week. So, so how many of you married preachers think you might be able to work out something uh, for me? And on top of that, Brother Lee Harbour is with me. Brother Lee Harbour is my uh, comedy sidekick and thorn in the flesh. I've been in the car with him for about 12 hours the last couple of days. Someone said, well, don't get sleepy when you're driving down to Pensacola. I said, there might be any chance of that. <laughs> well, the harbor will not shut up from the time we leave Memphis till we stop here. And then he didn't shut up then. So, but I'm glad to have him here with me. I'll be leaving him here, by the way, so he'll be... <laughs> He'll be needing a place to live if you have an extra room or something. We have 25 men who will graduate Sunday. We have 28 returning and 32 coming in, which means 60. And I told Brother Cates I was resigning because those are too many papers to grade. And just, but we're, we're thankful for that, but we do have a need also. We need some support for these fellows. They don't have to pay tuition, don't have to pay any fees, they have to buy the books, they have to be able to live. And where well, we usually have 50 or 55, we have 60 this year, and that's straining everything we have. So if anybody here would like to help in that work, see me, and I'll be glad to, to get you the information. Good men that, that want to preach the gospel, but they have to have some support. Liberalism and worship, we're going to we're gonna see tonight, liberalism in black and white. Brother Ori just got through, and now I'm ready to go. And so you see it in black and white. Liberalism and worship, he did a good job on singing, and I had some information in my uh, presentation on that, which now I don't have to do because he took care of that. But uh, I appreciate what he had to say. Why well, study this subject, liberalism and worship? Because gradually liberalism has infected congregations that before were good, sound, faithful congregations. It didn't happen overnight. It may have taken place over a period of years. But those congregations that went in the past as faithful and strong now are lost because of the influence and sometimes the interference of liberalism. And one particular aspect of liberalism's onslaught against the faithful is that it has attacked corporate worship. That just means our coming together in a body to worship. It has attacked corporate worship. The intent of liberalism is to dismantle Christian worship and replace it with something which God has not authorized and which God will not accept, but which is pleasing to those who are carnally minded, those who want to do what they want to do the way they want to do it. Well, what is liberalism? We've heard definitions already. It comes from a word that means free. 
and liberals of all stripes tend to view themselves as friends of freedom, particularly freedom from the shackles of tradition. Seems to be a few things that liberals hate worse than, quote, tradition, end quote. They proclaim themselves to be loving and tolerant. They cry law-keeping as if that were the unpardonable sin. But brethren have for decades shown that love and law-keeping are not mutually exclusive. Jesus said, If you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, 15. And God's requirements must be kept if we would have a right relationship with God and with the saints. 1 John 1, 3 through 10. They proclaim that they want relationships over requirements and love over law. Well, what is worship? Worship is obeisance, homage, and respect paid to God. It means to bow the knee to one who is worthy, to kiss toward. It involves intent, attitude, action, offering, sacrifice. And all of these motivated by loving respect for the one who is worshipped and guided by obedience to him and that in accordance with his will. God wants true worshippers, John 4, 23. He wants us to worship in spirit, that is, with a right attitude of heart, and in truth, that is, in accordance with the truth, the word of God, John 17, 17, as Jesus declared, John 4, 24. God has determined what He will accept in worship, and as Creator, He has the right to do that. And as His creation, we are to hear and obey. If we are to worship God acceptably, we cannot do that by saying, I will do what I want to do. I will do what I like, what pleases me. I'll change it to be the way I want it to be but we must do what God has decreed in His Word. And so worship of God is shown by the law of Christ, Galatians 6.2, involves praise, adoration, bowing before and honoring the sovereign God of the universe in the way that He has directed us to do. But liberalism affects true worship in these ways. Liberalism condemns true worship, number one. Liberalism changes true worship, number two, and liberalism corrupts true worship, number three. Liberalism condemns true worship. One of the most despicable aspects of modern liberalism, and there are many, but this is one that is most despicable, is the smug arrogance of the adherents of liberalism as they mock true worshipers and as they sneer at true worship. While liberalism preaches tolerance and acceptance, accommodation and love, they cannot tolerate what they call conservatism. They cannot accept what they term traditionalism. They cannot accommodate what they call legalism. It seems the most grievous, heinous, malevolent, Sin that one can commit is legalism, according to the liberalists. And they can love everyone but those whom they think are conservative, traditional, and legalistic. I know that from my own experience with loving liberals. I still have red ears from sitting in this office right back here. And people would call, thinking they were getting what I would write. I'd say hello, and that's as far as I go. And I'd listen for 30 minutes as they just ran in and raved and called me and everybody here everything but uh, what they all say. But I learned how to handle that. I would just write down what they would say, and when they finally took a breath, I'd say, now wait a minute, let me see if I got this right. You said we're this and this and this, and we do this and this and this. And then I'd say, isn't that the very thing that you've accused us of doing, what you now have done? And there would always be a silence on the other end because they knew they'd done exactly what they had called to accuse us of doing. I know how that love works when it comes from liberals. Liberalism will rationalize modern innovations and departures in worship, and they will simply say, well, you know, we've got to change with culture. Or they will talk about shifting uh, paradigms, or paradigms as you want to call them. 
Or they will talk about the fact that scholarship now shows us a better way. And they will wink at those who introduce these innovations, these change agents, and will commend them for their wisdom and for their courage, while they hatefully blast the faithful who raise opposition to these changes in worship. Liberalism seeks to minimize the plain Bible passages that condemn the changes that they seek to make. They tie instead the rights of a worshiper. They'll talk about how a worshiper is to worship in a way that is uh, pleasing to him, acceptable to him. And they will appeal to the fact that they say we must make worship palatable to the non-churched. Now, I understand there are people who are not in the Church of Christ who are looking for the truth and who will be receptive to it. But, you know, there are some people that are in a non-church that are that way because they want to be that way. They don't want to hear what God has to say. They're not going to do what God says to do. They're not going to be what God wants them to be. That's why they're the non-church. And so what they're saying is we've got to make it fit now where the non-church will find this appealing to them. They mock the simple, orderly worship that faithful brethren have been offering to God since the beginning of the church here on the earth on Pentecost Day, Acts chapter 2. They'll mock that, make fun of that, as we're going to see in a moment. Proverbs 17, 15 says this about such men. He that justifieth the wicked, and he that condemneth the just. Even they both are abomination to the Lord. And that's exactly what is taking place. Rebel Shelley is one of the leaders of the modern blight of liberalism, and along with Randall Harris, who wrote a book called The Second Incarnation. And they show their despite of the churches of Christ in this book as they misrepresent and they characterize in a very bad way members of the church and the church in general, let's notice some things they say. The tired, uninspiring event called worship in our churches must give way to the exhilarating experience of God. You can see how they think about worship. It is tired, it is uninspiring, it's an event. But notice they say in our churches, I think that indicates something. Our churches. Well, I know what they mean. But the church is the Lord's church, not ours. I think that shows a problem right there. They've got an attitude that somehow it's our church. It's the Lord's church. They quote A.J. De Tozer, who said, The gospel is preached by good men in our times may save souls, but it does not create worshipers. That is absolutely preposterous. You're not preaching the gospel if you're not creating worshipers. In the book of Acts, when people heard the gospel, believed it, and obeyed it, what did they do? They became worshipers. They say, oh, it won't create worshipers. Well, if it's not, you're not preaching the gospel. They write that the disinterest of non-Christians in the corporate event churches called worship assemblies Again, they call it an event, not worship. And even those who participate or who merely attend do so with a sense of hesitancy because of what they label the boring or irrelevant character of what happens in them. Young people sometimes complain about the archaic language and dull music of the church's hymns. I'm not surprised at that. Everywhere I've ever preached, there have been some who would complain. It wouldn't matter what you did. If you did it just like they said do it, they'd complain about that. Something wouldn't be right. And so just because people complain doesn't mean it's wrong. I've preached sermons before and one person come out and just praise me for a wonderful sermon. The very next one then I couldn't preach my way out of a wet paper sack. <laughs> Same sermon. Irrelevant? Well, not unless you're ignorant of the Bible and the doctrine of worship. Well, they continue. They talk about a personal encounter with God. Now, the dictionary says that an encounter is a violent clash, a meeting between hostile factions or persons. 
Now, where do you think they got this one in Canada? They didn't get it out of this book. They got it from their denominational cronies. That's where they got it. I grew up in a denomination. I heard that word a long time before Dr. Shelley discovered it. I know about encounters. I've been hearing it all my life. They say only when an encounter with the living God is fostered with whatever feelings may accompany that encounter has worship transpired. So you never worship unless you've had an encounter with God. What does that mean? A violent clash. A hostile meeting. I don't guess I've ever worshipped. They have a new tradition to replace the old tradition. And this shows the arrogance of such thinking. The new tradition is better because it's their tradition. They came up with it because they are superior in their scholarship and in their spirituality as they see themselves. Second Thessalonians 3.15 tells us we're to hold on to tradition. Hold fast that tradition which you've been taught whether by word or by our epistle. They say we impoverish our worship by restricting it with tradition. They say that becomes stifling. It closes off creativity arising from the Spirit of God and reduces the worshiping body of Christ to a rigid formality. Now the first thing that I wonder about that is how do we know about the creativity that arises from the Spirit of God? Is that through some feeling or a voice or a sign, some miraculous demonstration? How do we know about that? How do they know about something that arises from the Spirit of God, some creativity that we've stifled by our tradition? Are they not reading the same book that we have? Everything we know about how to worship is right here, friends. This book tells us why we worship God and tells us how we worship God, what God will accept. They say contemporary as well as traditional music has its place in worship. Now, by whose authority? By whose authority? I was in a place, well, I'm not going to say where, but not too long ago, and had a fellow leading singing, and I appreciate the fact he was leading singing. I know it takes courage to get up and lead singing. I'm not a song leader, but I appreciate the fact he was leading singing. But he led a couple of songs, and led both of them to the same tune, which was not the tune of either one of those. It was, it was sounding like home on the range. <laughs> and I've never signed just as I have the home on the range before, but I have not. <laughs> I don't know if that's contemporary music or what that was. I think it was a mistake. He says, they say, individuals, groups, and the entire congregation may offer the music under different circumstances. And Brother Owen just dealt with that. Colossians 3.16, Ephesians 5.19, we're all, we're all commanded to sing in corporate worship to God. But he continues by saying, Silas and Hubba are planned in spontaneous services. Uh, may have their place. Yet a repressive tradition will likely dictate a narrow range of possibilities and confine worship to a predictable routine. They continue, when the Spirit of God is present, it will not always be possible to determine the atmosphere in advance. Leaders may intend to prepare for a service of one sort, and God may bring about another end to His glory. I don't know how long it was ago that uh, Brother Hatcher sent me a letter inviting me to come to be on this lectureship. But I do know this. If it was six months ago or eight months ago, how long ago it was, I knew when I opened the letter and read it what we'd be doing tonight. It is predictable. Well, how is that? Because this book predicts what we are to do. It tells us what to do. And if that's a narrow range of possibilities because there are five acts or items of worship that God has prescribed in this book, if that makes a range of possibilities now, that's the way God wants it to be. It may go with that narrow way that leads to eternal life, Matthew 7, 13, and 14. But they say, you know, it may not be able that uh, you can predict this. You may not be able to predict it in advance. You may intend one thing, and something else happens when the Spirit gets a hold of you. Well, they don't blame that on God, see? And the departure from God, uh, that's obviously the Spirit's work. They'll blame that on God. And they say, we dare to offer a few suggestions on public prayer. They say, we need to write more prayers. 
right and read our prayers. I guess it's okay if a man were nervous and felt like he could not lead a prayer public without, uh, publicly without writing something. I guess that'd be okay. But they seem to think that writing public prayers is a requirement. While spontaneous prayer is often appropriate, it is a companion to written prayer rather than a substitute for it. I miss that some way. If you fellas know where that is, I need to see it. I was in the PTA back in the early to mid 80s. I was the president, legislative representative for the county. So I worked in the PTA and, uh, and worked very closely with those folks. And since I was president, I could direct the meetings. We always had a prayer. I called upon a brother to lead the prayer. I'd lead it. Never did call upon one of these denominational women to lead the prayer. Well, I don't know if that ruffled their feathers or what. But they came up with this idea. We're going to have a written prayer sent down from the PTA headquarters. And so you've got to read the prayer. Well, I haven't read one of those prayers yet. Those were generic nothing prayers is what they were. To somebody, somewhere, maybe, if there's anybody out there, about something, if there's anything to pray about. Well, I guess it's okay to write a prayer if you couldn't pray any other way. But I don't know that this book commands that, as they seem to indicate. On preaching, they say, we encourage the development of more theological preaching. More theological preaching. Those are say more biblical, more scriptural, sound, faithful gospel preaching, more theological preaching. I was preaching in Memphis at a congregation there, and a lady who really didn't care too much for me anyway told me one day, as she quite often did about my preaching, how bad it was, she told me one day that I needed to preach more like Brother Johnson. I said, well, how is that? She said, Brother Johnson uses a lot of philosophy in his preaching. I said, well, sister, all I know to do is just preach the Bible. And if you want to hear gospel preaching, I'll do my best to do that, but I'm not going to preach philosophy. She didn't seem to appreciate that. They recommend testifying with some reservation. We also suggest the use of testimony in the assembly. That doesn't surprise me a bit. does not surprise me a bit. That's where they're going. On structure, they say we need variety. We've got stagnation. We can't have stagnation. We've got to have variety. Two songs of prayer to song would be just almost unbearable for these people. So we've got to have three songs of prayer, or a prayer and two songs, and another prayer, or something. Uh, we can't have two songs of prayer to song, whatever we do. All that it means is that instead of having two songs of prayer to song, we start a new tradition where you do something different all the time. You still have a tradition. It's just a different kind of tradition. We want to be stagnated. They say there's a place for a raucous celebration. A place for a raucous celebration. Well, there is a place for that. It's on the ball field. When Alabama's one or something, it's not in the worship service. A place for a raucous celebration. They say none of us has the right to dictate how things always must be. Well, God does. He says right here in this book how we are to worship Him. And we have no right to quench the infinite variety. Infinite mean, means there's no end to it. Infinite, no end. Infinite variety of loving responses to the presence of God. And so we will respect what others do and we will not try to judge them and so on. In other words, if somebody wants to dance in the aisle, that's the way they want to do it. We shouldn't have anything to say about that. If you want to shout and jump the benches and roll around? We should just say, isn't that wonderful? There's an infinite variety of ways to worship God. Then they plead for the Lord's Supper to be the focal point of the church's corporate worship. Uh, Shelley's clone, protege, uh, John Mark Hicks, has written on that. Some of you probably have read that. And they have the prescription for dull, boring worship. That we could so spoil worship as to make it dull and boring to ourselves and unattractive to non-Christians is scandalous. Now notice the two groups there. Dull and boring to ourselves and unattractive to non-Christians. Where is God? Where is God? Our worship is to be offered to God. And we 
will to be happy with that. And those who are outside of Christ need to learn to be happy with that as well. And they will if they hear, believe, and obey the gospel. So let's recap some of these things. According to them, our worship, as they put it, is tired, uninspiring, dull, boring, predictable, stagnated, repressed, impoverished by tradition to a narrow range of possibilities, irrelevant to Christians and unattractive to non-Christians. Does that make you think that liberalism condemns true worship? But they also change true worship. The first question we need to ask is, does worship need changing? Worship that is offered to God the way God says to offer it does not need to be changed. The second question, the question is, who has the right, the power, the ability to dictate what changes ought to be made in worship? What man has that power? Well, there is no man. We need to study God's Word and know what it says. We need to believe what God has said. We need to do what God says in His Word. And we need to refrain from doing either what God has not said to do or what God has said not to do. And we learn all of that right here in this book. So we must worship God acceptably and we can. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God. Matthew 14. Worship Him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. Now the Bible records cases of those who attempted to change God's word and to change worship. Satan was the first change agent. He said, you shall not surely die. Genesis 3, 4. He couldn't change the truth or the consequences of disobedience though. Cain tried to change worship. Genesis 4. He did not offer his worship by faith as Abel did, Hebrews 11, 4, and Genesis 4, 4, and 5 says, unto Cain and to his offering, God did not have respect. He did not accept that. Now Hebrews, as they came out of Egypt, Exodus 32, tried to change the worship. And some 3,000 of them lost their lives. And God said in verse 8 of that chapter, they have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. That's what happens when we try to change worship. We turn away from the way God has commanded us. They had a Bible change worship. Leviticus 10, 1, 2. Jeroboam, 1 Kings 12. Put gold in calves at Dan Bethel. Change the place, change the object, change the priesthood, change the time of worship. And we just heard about what happened to him because of his sins. Well, modern liberals want to change the worship as well. They want to add solos, choirs, instrumental music. They want to sing during the Lord's Supper. One lady came to me after she visited off in a place in Memphis, and, and she came back so excited, and she said, You know, they sang during the Lord's Supper. I've never experienced that before. It was so wonderful. And she looked at me, and I said, You sinned. And you would have thought I'd hit her in the face with a wet cat. <laughs> And she looked at me like, what in the world do you mean? That's the most wonderful worship experience I've ever had. I said, you sin and do that. God doesn't authorize that. I said, what they ought to do is sing during the preaching. And by that way, they wouldn't hear the fellow tell you to sing during the Lord's song. <laughs> well, they have performances, testifying, swaying, clapping, cheering, shouting, and such like. And they change even the day of partaking of communion. Put women in roles of leadership in worship. They take the Word of God out of the pulpit, replace it with the ideas, the doctrines, and the anecdotes of men. They miss the point of worship. Worship is not focused upon man, but upon God. It is not a performance that we observe. It is a participation. We worship God. It is not for our entertainment. Or it ought to bring us joy. It ought to cause us to rejoice as we worship God acceptably. But it is not focused upon man. God has commanded worship that is simple and sincere, that is reverent and orderly, and that does not appeal to carnal men-pleasers. But not only does liberalism condemn worship and change worship, it corrupts worship. 
Because any change that man makes to what God has commanded is a corruption. It is never going to be better, but it's always going to be worse. I was in another country. I won't say where it was, Russia. But I was in another country, and I was looking at their alphabet. And I thought, what in the world is this? They had backwards numbers and upside down letters and things. And I thought, now, if you want to mess up an alphabet, this is the way to do it. Now, if you want to mess up worship, just let the liberals get a hold of it. And that's what they'll do. They're corrupt true worship. The focus of worship changes. The attitude of worship changes. No longer is it worship with the heart from the spirit of man. It's not appealing to the Spirit. It appeals to the flesh now. We're trying to please the flesh instead of worshiping God. It changes the pattern of worship from truth to error. It tries to make worship contemporary and appealing to men instead of trying to please God. I left a church of man for the church of Christ, Romans 16, 16. And I left all this junk behind me when I left. I thought I did and now we have brethren that are trying to out-denominationalize the denominations. It's amazing to me. In that denomination which I was, I heard that you can do in worship what you like, what makes you feel good, what you interpret the Bible to a while. You can do that in worship. What pleases you. Or if God has not specifically declared, Thou shalt not do this, then you can do that and be okay in it. Liberalism is doing the same thing today. My observation is this. They're just copying the Southern Baptists. They've fallen in love with Southern Baptist doctrine. They're teaching Southern Baptist doctrine. They're changing or trying to change the worship to Southern Baptist worship. Now, I have family members who are Southern Baptist. Matter of fact, there are about 12 or 13 preachers in those family members. And I love every one of them. I surely do. I want them to hear the truth, believe it, and obey it. But I'm not going to join in with them just because they're my family and because I want to be pleasing to them. At least that's just a fly. I was preaching last week. There was a horse fly. It looked like a bird. <laughs> Chase me all around the pulpit. <laughs> So at least I'm just drawing flies down here, not horse flies. <laughs> now I want to read a couple of things in the next ten minutes that I have here. One is about uh, Max Licato, and he was interviewed, and I've got all this in the book. And in the Baptist Standard, they talk about some churches of Christ that are using now instruments. And uh, you can read that. But Max Licato he was minister of Oak Hills Church of Christ, they say. Why are you the Church of Christ minister? Well, his dad was an elder. He went to Abilene Christian University, where his professors had a profound influence on him, he said. But he had been a part of a church in Abilene that was a progressive, grace-oriented church, so he didn't feel like he needed to change churches. He said, if I should leave Oak Hills, now listen to this, I couldn't see myself going to another church of Christ. I would go anywhere the Lord sends me. I think I would make a good Baptist. I think he's right. I think he's already done it. Then the question is, what do you say to those who say you sound more like a Baptist than a member of the Church of Christ? I say thank you, he says. I really do because I've benefited so much from the teachings of Baptists and so on. Well, shall we all just become good Baptists and just get along with everybody and be happy and all go to hell together? Worship in vain while we're here, Matthew 15, 9. Is that what we need to do? Liberalism corrupts true worship. Well, what can we do to stop the blight of liberalism on worship? First of all, we need to know the book. If we know the book, we'll know what's not the book. Second, we need to worship God in spirit and in truth. That will put to silence the critics of our worship, as they put it. If we worship as God intended, that will take care of that. I understand there's improvement sometimes for uh, various aspects of our worship. I understand that. I understand we need to be prepared. 
And we need to be sure our attitudes are all right. Worship is not a time to uh, be sleeping or passing notes, telling jokes, clipping fingernails and doing hair, playing ball games and uh, how we're going to cook dinner and all those things. Worship is a time to pour out our hearts before God in praise to Him because our hearts are filled with gratitude for what God's done for us. And we stand in awe of Him as our Creator. His majesty and His might. His mercy and His love. And how can we then but worship God? He deserves the best that we can do. Well, we have to expose liberalism for what it is, mark and avoid those who advocate it, those who are proponents of it. It does not give me any pleasure to say that this man teaches this or this man teaches that. I don't take any pleasure in that. But it's true. I didn't teach it, they did. They ought to be ashamed of themselves. They're going to be lost if they don't repent. And the sad thing about it is they're not going to be lost by themselves. They're going to take with them others, even whole churches, that they've led astray from the truth. Well, friend, don't let that happen to you. I fear for our children and our grandchildren. I fear for them. I wonder what influences will come to bear upon them in schools where they attend. In congregations, they may move off somewhere and, and move to uh, a place where a congregation that may not be what it ought to be because of the influence of men like we've been talking about tonight. It's, it's a dangerous situation. Souls are at stake. But I can tell you this, if we will hear God's Word, believe it out of it, do what God has authorized, our worship will be acceptable. And our lives will be pleasing to Him and we can be with Him eternally. It may be that tonight there are those here who have not as yet submitted their wills to the will of God, have not as yet partook of the great blessings that He offers in salvation, and that by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You can tonight, believing in Christ, John 8, 24, Repenting out of your sins, Acts 10, 38. Confessing your faith in Him, Romans 10, 32 and 33. Or 10, 9 and 10. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. You can then be baptized into Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. To have your sins washed away, Acts 22, 16. And that by the precious blood of Christ, Revelation 1, 5, that cleanses us from our sins and we contact that in baptism. We're buried with Him when we're baptized. And we arise from that watery grave to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, 3, and 4. If you haven't done that, why not? Why not? And why not do that tonight? Or maybe you haven't continued faithfully. Friend, let me tell you something. You're not only going to cause yourself to be lost. It might be that you help others to be lost. It might be that you help men just like we've talked about who despise the true church and the worship, you may help them by your ungodly lives. It may be farther for them. Don't let that happen. Be an influence for good. Make sure that you're ready for eternity and help all the others that you can to be ready by your faithful life. If you need to respond, we encourage you to do so while we stand inside. All the